Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus sends his 12 disciples out on a mission to share the gospel with the neighboring towns. And he offers them these words. I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of the wolves. So be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now I bet you've heard that phrase before. Wise as serpents and innocent as doves. But what does it mean? I could offer some ideas. Be smart but not conniving. Be creative, but not manipulative. But what exactly would that look like? I ask these questions because for the next three weeks, we're going to be focusing on a sermon series about justice and discrimination. And this is a rather sensitive issue. And it can be hard to address with ourselves and with others. If you try to address this issue of discrimination in the church or with people out in the world, especially with the gospel, you are going to need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So what does that look like? We're going to try and answer these questions by looking at Philemon for three weeks. Because in it, Paul starts out with dealing with a difficult issue. And I think he shows us what it means to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. He teaches us how to address difficult issues. You could call this the structure of hard conversations. He offers us a structure to make hard conversations and we would be wise to see how Paul works and then learn to apply it and use it in our own homes, work, and community. And after offering us this structure for hard conversations, Then he begins to look at the path of Christ, the way of Christ, to teach us Christ's response to the hard issue that he is wrestling with, with Philemon. We might call this the foundation of Christ's solution to difficult issues. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at the structure that Paul offers us, the foundation that he looks to solve difficult issues, and then apply these things to the issue of how justice might overcome discrimination. So that's what we're going to do this morning. And listen, I don't ever think so highly of myself as to encourage you to take notes. But today would be a good day for that. If you have a pen in the pews and you have your bulletin or on the back of your scripture text, I think there's wisdom in learning from Paul here and taking note of what he does. See, because Paul is a master with fierce issues. He addresses them frequently in his letters which is the first structural lesson that he offers. The first thing that you might take down in your notes. He addresses the issue. It might have been easier to let Onesimus stay with him and avoid the conflict, but Paul does not do this. He writes the letter puts it in Onesimus' hands and addresses the issue directly. If you take nothing else from this sermon, take this. Do not be conflict avoiders. 
It's the first structural lesson that Paul gives us. Face things head on or they will only grow harder to deal with. And the consequences of avoiding them will get worse and worse. That's the first thing that Paul teaches us about the structure of hard conversations. The second thing he does is he addresses his own issue. He sets his life before Philemon and he says, I'm a prisoner in Christ. Now he doesn't explain this. You notice that? He doesn't offer the full story of it. He simply lets this pregnant description hover before Philemon for him to note and maybe wonder about himself. And then, after he does that, he does the next two parts for the structural lesson of hard conversations. He addresses their personal relationship and acknowledges it, bringing it to the fore. And then he encourages Philemon for what he has heard about him. So let's deal with the first one. Paul has formed a personal relationship with Philemon. And this is crucial because it's much easier to address hard issues when you know each other. I don't know about you, but I find it rather difficult to walk out into the street and talk to someone I don't know and say, hey, wrestle with me about difficult issues. Let's talk about discrimination. Right? You can't wrestle with hard conversations unless you have trust. Trust is essential for fierce, honest sharing. And trust takes time. Time to build up. If you want to talk about things that really matter, build a relationship with the people that you love. Build trust so they can hear from you. Then Paul commends Philemon. Philemon loves the saints and is faithful to Christ. His work has reached the ear of Paul, his mentor. And Paul works to build up his student before challenging him. This is wise. No one wants to listen to you if you start into them tearing them up. Paul's structure says, build them up. Notice that which in them that you can commend in them. So here's where we are so far. Paul addresses the issue directly. He tells something of his own story. He builds on the relationship that he has with Philemon and acknowledges it and then encourages him with the good things that he sees in Philemon. Now you might be thinking, okay, he's ready to act now, but he's not yet. It's interesting, right? He doesn't make his appeal yet. He's not ready to make his request. First, he reminds Philemon that he, is, is, that he is his guide in the faith. He reminds him that Paul has the right to demand his obedience. To demand him to do his duty. But notice that Paul doesn't use his position to command. While acknowledging his role as a leader, he doesn't lord it over Philemon. He takes the servant's position. He makes an appeal while setting himself below Philemon. Structurally speaking, this is empowering for Philemon. Paul lifts Philemon up 
through the exercise of servant power. You notice that, right? Paul is the one who is setting the parameters of the conversation. But he exercises his power by lifting Philemon up. This is crucial. And in it, Paul is modeling what he hopes to receive from Philemon when he receives Onesimus. Do you see that? Paul is showing Philemon in his actions what he hopes Philemon will do with his slave. In any difficult conversation, fierce issues between you and a friend, a colleague, a boss, a spouse, you're modeling the behavior you desire from them is essential to resolving the difficult issue at hand. If you can't model the behavior what makes you think someone else is going to follow you? Or even desire to come to the end you're hoping for? If you can't do it, how can you dare ask them to? This becomes the, the most important part of the structural reality that Paul uses for these hard conversations. Modeling what you desire for everyone. Paul then makes his request. He's done all this to set up what he is going to appeal to Philemon and he finally makes his request. Free Onesimus. Not simply for Onesimus' sake, but for Paul's sake. He is Paul's child. He is Paul's student. And Paul reminds him, just as you are, Philemon. And Paul says, I need him. He says that Onesimus is my very heart. I need him. Maybe here we realize why Paul has first told his own story. That he is a prisoner in Christ. To cultivate sympathy and empathy within Philemon so that he can respond to Paul's need the same way Paul has responded to him. You see... Paul makes his request from a place of power. But he's using Christ's servant power. He will not force Philemon's hand. Philemon must choose. But Paul is exercising significant leadership and power to help Philemon find the path of Christ. He frees Philemon to make his own decision, but not without his guiding hand. Now you might be saying, well, Pastor Rodney, that sounds kind of manipulative. But students, colleagues, friends, acquaintances, anyone really needs to make their own decisions. They need to take responsibility to understand their place in the midst of hard conversations and difficult issues, but they also need guidance. It reminds me of the words of Scripture I want to, know, to do the right thing, but how can I if no one shows me? We need to be able to make those decisions and take responsibility in freedom, but we need guidance. We need encouragement. You cannot tell someone what to do. That won't work. 
But you shouldn't leave them dangling in the wind either. We all need guidance. Now in this structure, Paul is modeling servant leadership, coming alongside Philemon to guide him to the way of Christ. And our default might be something like, I'm just going to avoid this hard issue. I don't want to talk about discrimination with anyone. We may decide, well, I'm going to take a position of power and then command what has to happen. Or we may just think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to tell everybody what's wrong with them. And you know what? Those default positions don't work. They don't change anything. Silence puts you on the side of discrimination. Power puts you in a place of limiting and coercing other people. And telling people that they're just wrong, well, I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. Paul doesn't do these things. He shows us a different way, the way of Christ. He offers a structure of wisdom and innocence in tackling the toughest areas of life. And if you have that structure, use it. Form the way in which you think and engage with others through this way of dealing with the toughest issues. For Paul offers this structure, but in addition to that then, Paul offers us a foundation of Christ's solution. So let's turn there. This is the second thing. Paul appeals to Philemon on the basis of love. He commends the love that he sees in Philemon, taking note of how he treats the saints and his faithfulness to Christ. He invites Philemon to use Christ's lenses of love to view his slave, to see this one below him in a new way in the way of Christ. And notice that Paul does not ask more of Philemon than he is doing himself. Paul set aside his right to demand. He set aside his position of power over Philemon. And he sees him through the lenses of love lifting him up. Paul does not demand any more than he is willing to do. And in doing so, he allows Philemon to choose. For love cannot be forced. That's a good thing to write down. Love cannot be forced. It must be free. Now what you might notice is that Paul's structure, the very structure that Paul uses, is the foundation of love that he is calling Philemon to choose. Do you notice that? The form of the conversation is the function that he desires to happen. The medium is the message. How you choose to approach the difficult conversations in your life will reveal how you think they can be overcome. How you choose to enter into dialogue with someone else about that which is sensitive, difficult, and hard reveals the power you think will make it good. 
Now, if you choose Paul's structure for your fiercest conversations, you are setting aside your power to command or control. But in doing so, you are offering the very solution that Christ offers us in the gospel. For love opens its arms wide in the cross. It does not seek to grasp or control for its own means. So how might we apply this structure and foundation to the ideas of justice and discrimination? I think we start by claiming that the only way to equality, the only way to chipping away every day against discrimination is love. Love for the oppressed and the oppressor. For both are trapped. Both are trapped in a system of hatred and fear and, and disgust with, with the other. And that disgust rots us all. And the only escape for both is to see each other as worthy of love. As an essential part of Christ's life and God's creation. Love is the path of justice. The servant power of love is the only thing that sets us free. Whether we are the oppressor or the oppressed. Now let's be clear, let's be frank and completely honest. The oppressor, the one with the privilege and power, must give up more and must act first. The oppressor must give more in sacrifice and must do so freely. Or resentment and fear will always remain crippling reconciliation. This is the issue of discrimination in our country, right? The government from on top tells us what we have to do. Does anybody do it freely? Out of love? out of reconciliation, out of seeing that the other is the essential part of Christ's life and God's creation? No. So resentment and fear continue to percolate and we are always crippled in our reconciliation. Love must be voluntary. Which is hard. But it must be voluntary. And Paul sees these truths in the letter. And I don't know if you noticed it, right? But Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon. And he talks about how he loves him. Even though he's the slave owner, the one with privilege and power and the ability to have all that's above him, he loves Philemon. And he says, Philemon, out of your own voluntary will, set Onesimus free. Lift him up above you. Love Onesimus as if he is your very own. Because love as a structure will continue to work on us as oppressed and oppressor until we see through its lenses and with those lenses we can begin each and every day to cut away from the bindings of discrimination that hold us. Will we ever get there? with perfect equality and no more discrimination in our hearts and heads? Probably not. 
But love as our lens is continues to drive us forward to make it a reality. So let's end here. Our next two sermons will continue this theme. And we're going to address many ways that love can open our eyes, set us free, see as Christ sees, and live as Christ lives with open arms rather than grasping control. Well, let's end this first sermon into justice and discrimination with this simple lesson from Paul. We are called to model the behavior that love presents us in Christ. Maybe that starts with Paul, a prisoner, inviting us in to see that he desires most of all to set Philemon free by having Onesimus set free. And it's interesting because only a prisoner seems to be able to get that. He addresses the issue directly, builds on his relationship with Philemon, encourages Philemon, and leaves the power to change in Philemon's hands. This is the love we are called to model. And it's necessary for justice to overcome discrimination. May you learn at the feet of Paul. May you be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. May you be free modeling Christ and the power, love, and justice that Christ offers the world to set it free. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you do not leave us with easy answers. We would prefer it if you would just say one, two, three, and discrimination will end. But we acknowledge the truth that that simplicity does not reflect the reality of who we are as human beings. It does not reflect the complexity of the many issues that we wrestle with and how we can make our way through the fiercest of conversations, dealing with any tough issue in our lives. As we begin to wrestle with discrimination in our culture, our society, our church, and in our hearts, remind us of the way of Christ. Remind us to model the behavior that Christ has shown us in Paul or that Paul has shown us in Christ. You have set us free, O oh Lord. And, as, and in that freedom, you guide us in paths of righteousness for your sake. But we must take the steps. Give us courage to learn, to work, to take on the, the structures that Scripture has taught us and to live the foundation of Christ's love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response to the word of...